That's all right, I can talk from here. Hi. Okay, uh, the reading is from 2 Corinthians 9, uh, chapter 6, uh, sorry, verse 6 to 11. Um, the cheerful giver. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all, all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He, su he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. If you all want to stretch your hand out as we pray for Graham as we prepare to hear the word. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for this pastor that you have placed in this church, and we pray for his faithfulness in wanting to teach your word as you teach it. And Lord, we just pray for confidence, and we just pray for also sensitivity of the Holy Spirit that Graham gets out what you want him to say, not that what Graham wants to say, but what you want Graham to say to us through your word. And we pray for just an opening of our hearts and minds and be receptive to what your word has to speak to us through today. Amen. Why don't we just take a moment of silence before we hear the word of God, if you want to close your eyes and just put your hands out, do whatever you need to do. We're just going to acknowledge the presence of God together uh, before we hear his word. Your word says, God, that where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst. And so as we wait on you this morning, we thank you that that word is true that you are here, you are present, you are closer than the air we breathe, as the worship song says. And Lord, today, as we hear the scriptures, we want to acknowledge that we are hearing the word of our Father. We are hearing our Father's voice today. And we pray that you would, right now, just begin to supernaturally touch each person in this room with wonderment again at the fact that we're hearing our Father's voice, that we're hearing from God today. Lord, would you fill this place with your presence? Would you powerfully touch each individual, we pray. Touch our lives afresh, Holy Spirit. Pour out your love upon us today. Pour out your power and your love upon your people. Touch every heart. And as we prayed for Billy earlier, Lord, also we believe that you are a healing God today. And if there are people who've come in today, Lord God, who are carrying baggage, carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders, maybe walking with all sorts of pain, grief, depression, anxiety, physical ailments, whatever it might be, we thank you that they've come into the house of God today. They have come into the house of God They've come into the place where the true balm of Gilead is, where the true healer resides. And there is healing in this place today. There is power for healing. There is power for breakthrough. There is power for new mindsets, new ways of thinking, new ways of seeing the world because God is here, because the Lord of glory is in this place. Lord, we just push the reset button. We push the reset button. Maybe that mindset of the world that so easily gets a hold of us during the week. We push the reset button. We say, Father, would you come in today and just reset our minds to be focused upon you, to expect you to move, to expect you to touch us afresh, to expect you to bring your touch, your breakthrough, your will into our lives. Amen. 
The title of my message today is Sowing for the Harvest. And before you all switch off and think, why did I bother coming today to hear the pastor speak about giving? I don't want to hear it. Before you switch off, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that I'm going to do my best in the next half an hour to stick to what God's Word says about the subject of financial stewardship and giving. Because you don't want my opinions about those subjects. I don't really want my opinions about those subjects. But I do want God's Word about the subject of giving. I do want it. How many of you understand that whenever God speaks, whenever he says something, it's for the benefit of his children? He never says anything idly. How many of you waste words? It's one of my least favorite things about myself is that I waste words. I'm wasteful with the things I say. Sometimes we say too much, don't we? God never wastes any words. God never says anything that does not have meaning, power, and utility for our lives. And this is true of the subject of giving. And I just want to say that today because I'm speaking from experience Every time I've walked into a church and the pastor stands up and says, today we're going to talk about giving, my heart drops. And I'm sure we're all the same. We're all in the same boat, aren't we, with that? And I, and I excuse it, and there's grace. There is forgiveness. But I just want to encourage you, don't switch off. Don't switch off. Because if it's God's word, it's something we want to hear, isn't it? It's something we want to understand and to live by. It's, so, it's a subject I haven't addressed either for over a year. And I thought, today's as good a day as any to talk about it. Because this new building represents a new season for us as a church. It represents a different part of our journey together since that first Sunday when we met on Upper Green, actually, in Tetnal, with about, I don't know, a handful of us and a guitar. This is a new season, so I thought today's as good a day as any to talk about this. I like the NLT version of this passage because I don't know if you've read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 together, but they all kind of go as one conversation. It's Paul talking to the Corinthians about the subject of giving, about an offering that was being taken up, for the church in Jerusalem. And it, 2 Corinthians 8, the whole of that chapter, is more or less about these Macedonian believers. How many of you have heard of the Macedonian believers before? Paul says that they were a poverty-stricken group. They had very little at all. They were persecuted. They were oppressed. But Paul is basically bigging them up. He's like, listen, these guys have got nothing, but they gave abundantly more than they were able for the cause of the kingdom. And their giving should be an encouragement to you, Corinthians. It should speak to you of their faith. It should be a benchmark for you to aim at. It's all about these Macedonian believers, but it isn't, in my view, the easiest passage to read. It, it's a bit convoluted in the ESV sometimes, I find, or goes over my head. So the NLT sometimes makes it a bit easier to understand. So this passage in the New Living Translation says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly, or in response to pressure. How many even understand that's a good word? If you're feeling pressured to give, the Bible says don't. Well, that's a good word, isn't it? How many of you ever felt pressured to give? Yeah. The Bible actually says don't, don't, don't give in to that kind of 
fleshly pressure. And that's not what I'm here to do today. This is actually a message of God's grace, forgiving. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they'll thank God. There's a saying, isn't there? Ignorance is bliss. You heard that saying before? Ignorance is bliss. And basically, what it means is a person who does not know about a problem doesn't need to worry about it. That's kind of true, isn't it? Sometimes if we don't know about a problem, it's one less thing to worry about. You know, and when I'm aware of lots of problems, it's not very blissful for me. You know, when, I'm, when you've got your head on a swivel and you're aware of lots of things going wrong, it can be stressful. I had lots of that today. I had to get rebuked by my wife for having my head on a swivel, looking at all the problems and fussing about them and worrying about them. And she said, listen, you need to focus on what you need to focus on. Leave this to me. And I was struggling to do it. I was like, oh, I was worrying. It wasn't blissful for me. And I don't think she was encouraging me to be ignorant, uh, but she was just saying, hand this one over. And sometimes there is a truth to that, isn't there? That the problems we don't know about don't bother us. And there's a sort of a blessing in that, in a way. But is ignorance always bliss? Well, I remember a few years back, there was a post on Facebook, and I did a foolish thing. Years back, did a foolish thing. There was a debate going on on Facebook about a passage in the book of James. How many of you have gotten into a Facebook debate against your better judgment and have immediately regretted it? Well, this was one of those moments. I waded into the debate based on a piece of knowledge that I thought I had. There's a discussion about the book of James, and I had read a book by a really respected author on this particular passage. Now, this author had said he had found a particular secret in the Greek, in the original text, that made this scripture easier to understand. And I readily shared that information in the Facebook debate. Now, I was unawares, but the person engaged in the debate happened to be a Greek major from the University of Oxford. And I got schooled hard in that debate. Why? Because I was ignorant at that point of the Greek language, and I went in there with what I thought I knew. How many of you understand sometimes... Sometimes the greatest enemy to your progress in Christ is what you think you know. Sometimes the greatest enemy to your progress in Christ is what you think you already know. And I thought I already knew about this text and it turned out, whoopsie daisy, I'd gotten bad advice from this book that I'd read. And in fact, this person wasn't correct. Now, the Lord taught me a painful lesson in that, but do you know what I did? I spoke to the person that schooled me. In a private message, I said, you know what, you're right. And I said, would you mind teaching me how to read Greek? She has been my antonym, and she has been my Hebrew and Greek teacher now for five years. And I can now read biblical Greek, and I can, I'm on the way to reading biblical Hebrew. But that ended up being a cure for my ignorance in that area, and it has been a blessing. But was my ignorance a blessing to others? I'd like to wager that it wasn't. I'd like to wager that sometimes ignorance is blissful for the ignorant person, 
but it's a curse to everybody else. Isn't it? How annoying is it when you know something and you could help somebody, but they don't think they need your help. They think they know already. If you're a parent, you'll know how that feels all the time. I remember my mum used to say to me all the time, you think you know everything. You know, we've lived a little bit longer than you. I think we've got things that we could teach you that you already know. You know, it's the ignorance and the, the, the kind of presumption of youth. So ignorance may be blissful to the ignorant, but it's a curse to everybody else. In 2 Kings 22, the King Josiah sends a group of men to go up to the temple and to collect the money that's been raised there for repairs on the temple. And when he gets there, the priest, Hilkiah, says, listen, we found a book in the temple. It's the book of God's law. We found it in here. They hadn't had it for many years, and they took it back to King Josiah. King Josiah rends his garments. He rends it. He tears his clothes. He's enraged. He's impassioned. He's sad. He's angry. Why? Because the people of Israel have been living in ignorance of God's word, and therefore, what have they been doing? They'd been sinning against God without even realizing. They'd been sinning against God and not even knowing it. So they, that, that ignorance for them may have been, in a sense, blissful. They weren't aware when they were sinning. Was it blissful to the whole people of Israel? No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't blissful for them because you know what? When Josiah sought the Lord and said, we found the book of the law, God. Do you know what God said? And because you lost it, there will be judgment that comes upon you. Even though you found it now, there will be a judgment that comes against Israel. So ignorance is not bliss in the end. And today, as we study this word, that's my aim, is to make us less ignorant of God's word on this subject. Because, why do I say this? Because I think this subject of giving and financial stewardship is one of the greatest areas of ignorance in the body of Christ today. Why? Because it's either been criminally underrepresented from the pulpit or it's been criminally misrepresented from the pulpit. Those two extremes. And so therefore there is a great deal of ignorance on this particular subject. And I think there, that God is going to have words to say to many of the pastors in the West these days when they arrive to meet him. Because a pastor who leaves out weighty subjects or difficult matters in Scripture and constantly focuses on the good stuff is like a parent who only feeds their child junk food. How many of you understand if you eat junk food for a living, if you feed your kids consistently on junk food, they are going to be unhealthy children? We have a church in the West full of unhealthy children. They've been raised and fed on candy floss. And so guess what? When you try and feed them a vegetable or give them medicine, they spit it out. They don't like it. Give me the candy floss. I don't like this word. Even though that particular word could do them a great deal of good, they don't like it because they've been raised on candy floss, and they don't know any better. They're like a child. Medicine rarely tastes good, unless it's cowpaw. Oh, hallelujah for cowpaw. But <laughs> cowpaw's the anomaly. Every other medicine tastes disgraceful. But guess what? It can heal the body, can't it? And it's the same with some of these more difficult doctrines in Scripture, is that often they're like medicine. The first taste isn't necessarily good. You know, we could talk about the, the doctrine of original sin or depravity, total depravity, right? Nobody likes that. Do you want to hear about your, your total inability to please God outside of grace? I don't want to hear about that. Tell me about how I'm a child of God and how I'm amazing and I'm a victor and I'm going to overcome. Tell me about that stuff. Well, I, I can't tell you that unless I tell you first about your natural state. Well, I don't want that. I don't like that. It doesn't taste very nice. Well, I'm sorry, but it's going to do you a great deal of good because it's going to make you grateful for the grace of God that you didn't deserve. It's going to make you think more of God and less of yourself. 
It's going to make you more humble. It's going to make you love Christ more. It's going to make you preach the gospel more. But it doesn't taste very nice. And that's the same for this message, I think, about giving. Two of our greatest enemies in our struggle to grow in the things of Christ are our preferences, what we like, what we don't like, and what we think we already know. What we think we already know. Let me just run through a few statistics today about giving because I think this is germane to the subject. I think this is important for us to know. I don't think that Hope City Church is an accurate representation of what we see on large. This is actually a very generous church. Many of you give regularly. So please don't take this as a condemnation at all. This church isn't like this. But general statistics in the US show that 5% of churchgoers in the United States regularly tithe. A tithe is simply when somebody gives 10% of their income to the church. Church development statistics say that only 5% of churchgoers do actually regularly tithe. The Church of England did their parish survey in 2019, so this tells us a bit about how things are in the UK. They found that the number of regular givers, that is people who give a monthly standing order or give weekly, the number of regular givers is declining. In fact, it's declined around 20% over the last 10 years. So it's an aging demographic. The older folk tend to be regular givers. The younger folk, not, not as yet. Okay, So number of regular givers is declining in the UK in the CV. And regular givers in the UK on average in churches gave around 2% of their income. In the CV, it worked around out to about £14 pounds a week. Um, So 2% of of income. So this is just some interesting statistics. And in general, a large proportion of churchgoers don't give regularly to their local church. So why is this a big deal? Why bother talking uh, about this? Why bother addressing this? If that's the case and people are not generally giving much or are not giving regularly, what's the problem with that? Well... I think I could point to a few practical issues that we can all see. A friend of mine, uh, you don't know him, not from around here, but a friend of mine uh, has had to leave his ministry. Has had to leave his ministry after 30 years of service at a church down in London. He's had to move out of his manse because the church can't afford to have that manse, that property for him anymore. He's in his 60s and he's having to to leave the ministry and move out of London because they can't afford to live there anymore and he doesn't have the manse anymore. So that's 30 years of ministry service and now really difficult and sad for him. He's not even going to be able to live in the same community that he served for 30 years because basically the church couldn't afford to do it. Now he's a biblical minister, he's a great teacher, great pastor teacher, very sad story. But what if that church had faithfully sown into that ministry for years? Maybe things would be different. So one thing that is happening is that ministers are leaving jobs because they have to work two or three jobs to support themselves in the work of the ministry. Or they're burning themselves out trying to work those other jobs as well. In other cases, churches are closing uh, because they, they can't keep open. So there are practical things that are happening as a result of the lack of of regular giving in church. Now, I think another big part of it with the younger generation, this is my my story really, is that my heart was ready to give and I was more than happy to give, but I just didn't plan to do it. I I just kind of never really planned to do it. And it wasn't really until university when I was challenged on that. And I think a big part of it is that, it's just... It's not a heart issue, it's just we haven't really planned to do it and therefore it it kind of doesn't happen because it's not in the budget. So I think that is another reason why it happens uh, rather than necessarily being teaching. So I think some of the things that are happening with that is really that we are seeing churches close, we are seeing ministers leave and I think ministers should live humbly. I don't believe that ministers should be paid like football players. Um, Maybe you disagree, but I don't think ministers should be paid in a way that is ostentatious or 
maybe causes them to live in a manner in which their congregation doesn't live. I think that's, I think that would be causing an offense to others who might want to receive that message of the gospel. But equally, I don't think that a minister should be called to live in abject poverty. And I think that is the way that many see it these days, is that if you're, if you're in ministry, you're just signing up to live on the breadline. And I don't think that honors God. I don't think that is putting ministers in a position in the UK where they can serve and give the best of themselves if they can't afford to pay the mortgage or put bread on the table. So I think there has to be a balance between the two. So you don't want to hear me whine on anymore about giving, but my job is to encourage you to look to the scriptures on these things. So what does the Bible say to us briefly about giving? Firstly, it tells us this. This is the linchpin for me of understanding about our money. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So before we think about anything else, about whether New Covenant believers are supposed to tithe or whether they're not supposed to tithe or how much they should tithe or whatever, we've got to understand this. Our money is not truly our money. Your money is not your money. It's God's money. And he's given it to you as a stewardship. That's what this verse is teaching. So we have to connect and first think about money and finance as a stewardship of God's property. Now that makes me think differently about my money. Because when I think it's mine, maybe I'd be a bit more reckless with it. But when I think, oh my gosh, it's the Lord's property, it makes me a bit more careful with how I choose to use what belongs to him. And giving is mentioned all the way through the Old Testament and in the New. I think often we think of giving as like an OT thing. It's an Old Testament thing. Yep, they gave in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, not much mentioned. But it's in both, in the Old and the New Testament. And there are a few things in the Bible that link up about the subject of giving. Maybe you can't see that top one, but first is giving, and this is a New Testament scripture, giving is actually an act of worship. How many of you understood that giving, financial giving, is an act of worship? Paul says in Philippians 4.18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent So he's talking about money that has been sent to him by the Philippian church as he's working in a different place. And he says, the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So giving is first and foremost an act of worship. It's an act of worship. It's an opportunity for us to please God, to bless him with our finances. I love that. Because often I don't think I always connect giving with worship. I connect my singing with worship, what we did earlier when we we sing together. I'll often think of the type of worship that's mentioned in Romans 12, 1, offering my body as a a living sacrifice, that kind of worship. But I hadn't always connected the idea of giving my finances into the kingdom as, as worship, but that's what it is. It's an act of worship. Secondly, giving in the scriptures is an act of obedience. It's an act of obedience. In the Old Testament, God often judged his people's obedience on their giving. Like it or not, it's there in Malachi 3, 8 to 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. And you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that may be food in my house. And thereby thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more. So giving was often a test of obedience in the Old Testament. And thirdly, giving is evidence of God at work in us. It reveals the heart. Matthew 6, 21 
says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. Now in the Old Testament, giving was a bit different than it is now. They didn't just have one tithe, and of course a tithe is what? Giving 10%, 10% of your produce. And what they gave in those days wasn't money. It was their produce. It was what they grew um, on their land. And they wouldn't just give one tithe. They actually gave about three. So they would give back 23%, there or thereabouts, of their annual income. And they would give that to supply the Levites who were serving uh, in the temple and who didn't have any inheritance of their own. Um, They would use that to support the temple as well. And on top of that tithe, so not included in it, but on top of it, they also gave what were called free will offerings. A free will offering was if you got blessed in some area of your work, you received an inheritance, they would then choose to freely give out of that on top of their tithe to the house of God. So they gave, I would say that's a fairly, was very generous, isn't it? That's what they would give. That's what God commanded them to give in the Old Testament. Now, In the New Testament, it's slightly different. In the New Testament, under the covenant of grace, the tithe doesn't work quite in the same way. Because we we don't have Levites, per se, that serve in a temple. We don't have a temple. Um, We don't all own land that we can give produce from the land. So the tithe isn't quite the same. It's not required today in the same way that it was in the Old Testament. So we're not under law, is what I'm saying. You're not legally required to give 23% of your income. But the principles do continue. The principles of giving continue from the old to the new. And that's the case right through the Bible, isn't it? We've got to be careful that we don't draw too heavy of a line in between the old and the new testaments, as I think we're often prone to do, aren't we? You know, but actually you can see God's grace in the old and in the new, can't you? You can see Jesus in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament. And just as you can see giving in the Old Testament as a principle that God is pleased with, you can see it in the new. So the principles continue to today. In fact, the Apostle Paul even connects the Old and the New Testaments in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought into the temple? And those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrificial offerings. And in the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. So you can can see there, Paul is actually connecting the Old Testament Levites and their support through the giving of Israel with the New Testament preachers of the gospel. And saying, just as you supported them, so should you support those who preach the gospel if you benefit from it. So giving in the New Testament, what are you required to give, where to, who to, how? Let's just run through that quickly before we close, shall we? Just to make it clear. Firstly, and I say that you shouldn't just give to your local church, but you should first give to your local church. It should be a requirement of every person who's a member of a local church to support that local church through giving. Why? Because we are commanded to support the work of those who preach the gospel. We're commanded to support them. Paul actually talks about it as his being his right to be supported by those who he served in the gospel. He says he didn't take that right, but he said, I was entitled to it, but I chose not to for your sake. So a minister can choose not to receive pay if they want, but it is their right. So giving to support a Christian minister, your pastor, your elders, now I'm not trying to force you to support me, uh, but I am teaching you a principle here. I am teaching you a biblical principle here. Is that it is the right of a pastor or elder to be supported by the congregation. The pastor elder shouldn't be made to feel as though they are a charity case, although they should live off scraps or handouts. They should be. It is their right to be supported by their congregation. And of course, That should not be an ostentatious, exorbitant amount. And that's not how we work things at Hope City Church. We're very frugal in terms of what we do take from the ministry to support my work. 
but it is a biblical principle that that should be the case. And if the money weren't there to support us, then there's a decision to be made, but the principle is there. Secondly, our giving is to support the poor. We always want at this church to have enough money to be able to give away to support those who are in urgent need. And it's something we've done in the three years that we've been around as a church consistently is to support the work or support the poor in need. We want to be able to do that, and that is another biblical principle for us. The whole background of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is giving to the poor, giving to poor believers in Jerusalem. So that's another principle for us, is that the church we're in, as we give to them, they should be looking to help the poor in some way, shape, or form. And fourthly, our giving to our local church should also support the work of mission or missionaries. Paul was a missionary, wasn't he? And the Philippians were supporting him as he sowed into another church. Not their own, but to another church. And you did that recently by your giving. You may not even be aware of this, but in your giving to Hope City Church, your giving went to support the mission that we just did in Wolverhampton. It paid for the flyers. It paid for food that fed the ministries, sorry, the missionaries, to go door to door and tell people about Christ. So your giving should also go and support mission. So how should we give? How should we give? Well, I think Scripture gives us a hint that we should give as individuals to our local church as intentionally and as consistently as we're able to. I'm not saying that it's always going to be possible for you to do that. Sometimes it won't be. But as it's possible, we should try and be as an intentional as, and as consistent as possible. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside something and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. So Paul's saying, I don't want it to be that I don't see you for a year and then I come to collect this offering for the saints in Jerusalem and you're like, oh yeah, um, oh, let me just... You know how it was in school Eucharist growing up? The offering plate would come round and there'd be like a few coppers in there and everybody would be like, you know, oh yeah, there you go, there's, there's my 5p, there you go. Or if you hadn't, you hadn't even got coppers in your pocket, this is what I used to do, this is dreadful. The plate would come past and you'd flick the coins just to make that sound so that somebody thought you'd given something. It's dreadful, isn't it? But Paul says, Graham, don't ever do that. Never do that, Graham. Be consistent. Plan. Set up a standing order or budget for it. However it works for you, but try and be intentional and consistent in your giving. Many of you do that uh, already. Um, Secondly, it should be according to your means. Okay, so not everybody's to tithe or give the same amount, whether you tithe or whether you don't. Um, It's up to you to set that marker, and it should be according to your means. Okay? And thirdly, Paul says it should be whatever amount we purpose in our hearts to give. So there's the difference between the old and the new. Can you see that? In the old, it was a 23%. This is what you give. If you fail to give that, it's not good. Okay? In the new, it's whatever is according to your means and is in your heart that you've purposed to give between you and God. Okay? But we've got to try and do that as intentionally and consistently as, as we can. Now, people will say something like, when we talk about these things about giving, but this isn't a good message for people who don't have anything. This is condemning for those who have no money. All I want to say to that is that God makes certain promises to us of blessings for us when when we choose to give. God makes promises. And all I would say is, is, listen, we've all been through seasons when we've had little. But if God is saying to us in his word, listen, if you will be faithful in stewarding what I've given you, and give according to your prosperity, according to what you've got in the accounts, then actually I'm making promises to keep you safe, to make sure you've got enough. And I don't think that's a bad message to give somebody who doesn't have much. I think that's a good message to give them, if I'm honest. You see, Paul spends the whole of that chapter, 2 Corinthians 8, praising believers who had little, very little at all. And maybe what they gave monetarily wasn't much. But their heart, he says, flowed out with liberality. That They gave over and above what they were able. Maybe it wasn't a big money amount, but it's like the widow with two mites. 
You know, she gave that money. Jesus didn't go to the collection box and say, you can't afford to give that, take it back. He praised her for what she did give. So it's about the heart. And God promises certain things to us when we give. And this is where I'll close. Firstly, he says that giving is something that pleases him. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. That's something I want to grow in, is my cheerfulness in giving. Not just the fact that I do it, because sometimes when I set up a standing order, I don't even think about it. It just goes out each month. But I want to be cheerful about it. I want to be happy that my money's going somewhere to support the work of God. Secondly, God's word says that when we give, we're participating. We're actually participating in the gospel. That's from Philippians 1. So when you give, it's not just that you're handing over coppers or coins, whatever. You're actually participating in the work that you're giving to. So in my giving, I've participated in preaching of the gospel all over the world. How many of you understand I, through my giving, have participated in educating people in apologetics all over the world? I give to a ministry called Reasons to Believe. I have done for years. My contribution has participated in that work. God also promises in 2 Corinthians 9 that if we give, we'll have all that we need. We'll never be in lack because we've given. And I think that was always a worry of mine was that if I give, I'm not going to have that money to then spend on things I need. But God has made a promise in 2 Corinthians 9 for us that when we do give, that we will have all that we need, which for me is a real comfort. He actually also says that he'll cause profit to increase to your account. Now, it says that in Philippians 4.17. Paul says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. Whether that profit is monetary or whether it's something else, God has promised that he will bless those who give and that he will cause good things to come for us. He also says that when we give, we'll reap bountifully. When we sow bountifully of our giving, we will also reap bountifully. And again, he makes another promise. He says he will multiply our resources. He'll multiply our resources, 2 Corinthians 9. So if we give, what he also says is, I'll keep giving you stuff that you can give. I'll keep giving you more seed to sow. I'll make sure you've always got enough. For me, those are really encouraging words that help me to feel better about sowing into the kingdom. And finally, others will glorify God because of your giving. Others will glorify God because we chose to sow into God's kingdom. We serve to finish with a giving God. We serve a God who didn't just give us sentiment. He didn't just speak from the heavens and go, I love you. Belinda, I love you. Darren, I love you. He didn't send a greetings card, did he? He sent his only son. He sent his only son. His love message was a message wrapped in flesh and blood. Jesus Christ. He gave his only begotten son. Not just to come down and share a sentimental message about love, but to come and literally give himself on a cross for you and I. So we serve a God who gave. And that encourages me too in my giving, that I want to follow Christ in his footsteps. As he gave his life for me, then I want to be able to give of what he's given me and sow back into his kingdom. Let's stand. I'm going to invite Yvonne and the worship team to come now. We do have at the back, we've got today um, gift aid forms that are ready. If, if you don't gift aid already and you'd like to take a form, they're going to be at the back for you to take away with you. And I would just like to encourage each of you to, to go away and think this week. As we've moved into this new facility, we have been very careful not to overspend. But of course, this is slightly more expensive than the last place we were. And so there are additional needs in the congregation that we are looking to cover. They are covered for the time being, but we would like you to consider, is what you're giving right now generous? It, would you say it's generous? Would you say it's according to your means? Those are things to go home and think about and pray over um, as we finish up.